Um, thank you very much indeed, and welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Councillor Darren Sanders. I'm the Cabinet Member for Housing and Preventing Homelessness. Um, please be assured that we have put appropriate cleansing and social distancing measures in place to ensure that this meeting is undertaken in a COVID-secure manner based on the current restrictions. Um, this has included a request for all attendees to have taken a lateral flow test within 48 hours of the meeting using the NHS track and trace app or attendee log, two meter or six and a half feet social distancing, wearing masks when not seated and a one-way system here in Portsmouth Guildhall where this meeting is taking place. Limited public seating has also been made available, however this meeting is also being webcast, which is probably how you're watching it, to allow the public to attend remotely if they so wish. Um, please be advised the public seating area is not in view of the camera used to webcast this meeting. Um, can I please ask members uh, to remain seated throughout the duration of the meeting and to wear a face covering unless seated. Now, my understanding is that there are no deputations to this meeting. That is correct, right, okay. So just a little bit of housekeeping. If the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room and public gallery by these stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble in the turning circle at the end of King Henry Street, past the University's Park building, and also uh, past the various uh, uh, Portsmouth on Ice things as well. Um, in order to comply with the Guildhall Trust's fire marshal regulations, these are the people who run this building, anyone who signed in at the reception desk should sign out when leaving the building at the end of today's meeting. So again, just to say that this meeting is being live streamed, everyone speaking by, via a microphone will be on camera, including those making deputations. Sorry. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly that they do not wish to be recorded. Please can everyone use the microphones and remember to switch them off when they have finished. So after all that, which is for the people attending this meeting, I will go around and introduce various people for those massed hordes watching. Um, Anna, can you begin, please? Anna Martin, Democratic Services. That's kind. Paul. Paul Fielding, Assistant Director for Housing in the City Council. Thank you. Claire. Claire Hardwick, Head of Private Sector Housing. Lovely. Hello. Alan Denford, Group Accountant. Okay. Bear in mind that in this chamber, everyone has to sit in the green dot space. So if you're sitting in the green dot space, Alan, that is superb. If your desk does not have a green dot, you are meant to move to a place with a green dot. I do apologise for this, Alan, and you may not know the, the delights of the, the Guildhall Trust's uh, COVID regulations, but that's just one way of doing it. Thank you. Young Cal. Cal Corkery, Opposition Spokesperson for Housing. Thank you. Scott. Scott Pettis-Harris, the Conservative Spokesperson for Housing. Thank you very much. And hello you at the back. Trot, please switch on your microphone. Hi, uh, I'm Felicity Goodyear. I am here as a representative of the Consortium, Residents Consortium. That's very kind, Felicity. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we have no apologies for absence. Um, Cal and Scott, do you, I have nothing interesting to declare in this meeting. Do you have any declarations of interest at all? No? Okay, fine. So we've got one item uh, today, which is the Private Sector Housing Financial Assistance Policy. Um, for Felicity's benefit, as this is your first time, um, what will happen is I will ask the officer corps to introduce the, the report. Then if you have any comments, or the consortium has any comments about this, please feel free. Please feel free to ask any questions um, at all. And then I will come to Cal and Scott for their, to do the same thing. And then I, will also, I may also ask questions and have comments, and then we'll try and sum up. Is that all right, Felicity? All right, thank you very much. This is relatively informal, okay? So please feel free to um, well, say what you like within the confines of no swearing or anything like that, okay? Right, so who is introducing, oh, well done, Alan, excellent, you've moved to the green dots, this is marvellous. So who is, um, who's gonna introduce this? Claire, fire away. Thank you. Um, so this report seeks approval to amend the current private sector housing financial assistance policy in Portsmouth. So the current policy ha has assistance packages which fall into two main categories, which are disabled adaptations and home repairs and improvements. 
So the council has a statutory duty to provide disabled facilities grants to help disabled occupants living in the private sector with property adaptations which help them to stay in their homes safely, improve their independence and quality of life. The national criteria for disabled facilities grants, which we often refer to as DFGs, is outlined in legislation, but the local authority does have the power to set their own local policies and are encouraged to do so. So, for example, the national maximum award for DFGs is £30,000, which hasn't changed for 14 years, despite a significant increase in the cost of building work over this period of time. In 2013, the funding for DFGs changed, so instead of a direct grant allocation from central government, the grant became disseminated through the Better Care Fund, and the intention of this was to integrate provision of help with home adaptations across housing, health and social care systems to achieve better health and well-being outcomes for residents. The private sector housing team have recently undertaken a pilot scheme which is funded through that Better Care Fund to trial the following measures, which are to increase the DFG maximum award from £30,000 to £40,000, um, to make DFGs available to shared, live care, shared life's carers and special guardianship cases, and also to remove means testing as part of the DFG process. The pilot scheme was successful in streamlining, streamlining the process for DFGs and making adaptations available to more people who have been assessed with a physical need for adaptations in their home. So the Better Care Fund Board have agreed to provide this additional funding on a permanent basis. But in order to establish this as a permanent change to the policy, um, it must be formally updated. As well as the disabled adaptations available through the current policy, home repairs and improvements are also available to help vulnerable homeowners in the city to ad address disrepair to their properties which could be hazardous to their health. This is currently provided through a range of grants or low cost loans. As the policy um, currently includes grant packages which are not repayable, the budget is diminishing and um, threatens the sustainability of the service. Therefore, two options for change for the policy were considered to ensure that the service could continue. The first option was to change the service to make it only available after certain means testing criteria is applied, um, but this option would preclude some people um, who would be in need of accessing the service. The second option was to change the policy to offer interest-free loans to carry out these essential repairs. Um, applicants would need to repay their loans through affordable repayment plans and this change to the policy um, doesn't disadvantage any of the service users. So in order to still be able to help those vulnerable homeowners in the city, it's recommended that the loans available are amended to interest-free loans, which, depending on the applicant's um, circumstances, would either re be, be repayable on a monthly basis with the repayment plan tailored to their financial affordability, or would only become repayable when the property is sold or the owner of the property um, is transferred. So all loans would be registered as a charge with local, um, sorry, with land registry to ensure that the loan would be repayable if the property was sold or transferred. And finally, it's proposed to introduce a new top-up grant specifically for recipients of boiler replacement grants through the City Council's energy services team, where additional funding is required for ancillary costs such as asbestos surveys or scaffolding access, which is not currently covered by the main boiler replacement grant. If approved, this policy would be made available to the public um, by being published on the Council's website. In addition to the private sector housing um, service would be, a, would be made available, um, sorry, would be um, aware of the policy and ensure that residents who are in need of financial support will be helped according to the policy. And finally, it would be promoted internally to the Council and externally through relevant organisations and contractors. So for the reasons outlined, it's recommended that the Private Sector Housing Financial Assistance Policy 2021 is, um, as outlined in Appendix 1, is agreed and implemented from today. Thank you for that, Claire. That's very helpful. Um, Felicity, 
Um, sorry, I've got an uh, apology from a, a Maria Cole of the Residence Consortium, which I didn't mention earlier on. Felicity, do, do you or any other members of the consortium have any comments about this? And if the answer is no, that's absolutely fine. No. That's okay. That's, that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much for that. Cal. Thank you. Um, yeah, I haven't got too much to say on this for once. I think most of it is pretty straightforward and common sense. Um, I would like to ask a question, if possible, about... So, clearly, a large part of this policy is about the, the council funding capital works to people's homes, uh, whether it be through grant or loan. And I guess the question in my mind is, to what extent can the council require high or higher environmental standards as part of those works? Um, as an example, if we're replacing someone's door for an accessible door, can we require, if we're paying for it, that it be the most energy efficient door or one of the most energy efficient doors possible? I appreciate there's what building regs says, which would obviously be the minimum, but actually building regs in terms of environmental standards haven't quite caught up with where the rest of the world and the, and the country is. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my question really, is to what extent can we require those higher standards through this policy if we're funding works in people's homes? And can I, sorry, Cal, if that's okay, can I just add to that? Firstly, is there any barrier to that? And secondly, so that's in addition to, to Cal's point, which is, can we do this? And secondly, is there any barrier to us doing this? Um, so it is entirely at our discretion, the, the, um, that part of the policy. So we would absolutely have the discretion to do that. There wouldn't be any barriers in the way of doing that. Um, and as long as it was cost effective as well, um, residents shouldn't, I, I would have thought, be um, objecting to that being part of the works either. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Cal? It does, yeah. I mean, I guess what we or you were being um, asked to do today is to approve the policy. I guess the, the question for me is, is it worth actually putting something or is it possible to put something in the policy um, so it's there in black and white to make clear that that will be the approach where possible and feasible? Yeah, I'll, if, I can, if I may, I'll come back to that when it's my turn, if that's all right, Cal. That's good. Did you have anything else? No? No, thanks. Okay, Scott. Thank you, Councillor Sanders. Let's just uh, go through it line by line. It's probably an easier way of doing it, if that's all right with you guys and girls. Sorry, Claire. Um, in, obviously, increasing the grant from thirty to forty thousand. I think I'm just I'm reading obviously why it's obviously because of the increase in works. Um, is that generally because I mean it says here that the adaptations are obviously a lot more expensive than what we want to be doing. Has that cost increased significantly, like post uh, COVID, for example, with obviously supply chain being as it is? So we have seen increase in building costs since COVID, um, but this actually um, this increase in costs has been. Um, rising year on year for, for a number of years. So COVID certainly has had an impact as well, but um, that, that £30,000 grant limit hasn't changed um, for 14 years. So, yeah. so it, it, regardless of COVID, I think that there would be a need for that to be increased anyway. Yeah, okay. I, th I think, I think if probably if I think what I'm gathering from that is that COVID has probably accelerated the process a little bit more than where we were previously, which is fine. I mean, I, t I totally get that. Um, obviously, market forces. I'm looking at the DFG funding. Obviously, you're saying 1.6 per annum, and obviously your forecast at the moment for 1.4, which is quite a good number. I mean, last year was 1.1. I mean, that's a 300,000 pound difference. Can you just tell me how that has, how you've worked that out, or how that is going to be spent in terms of we're going to have a shortfall, we're going to be okay? Sorry, you're asking me to clarify the yeah the 1.1 yeah why there's going to be an increase in 300,000. Yeah. Um, so, during the period of COVID, some cases, um, officers weren't able to go out and do inspections on cases, so that has had Absolutely. an impact on the, the spend and the budget. What we're seeing, if this new policy is, is introduced, is not only are officers out doing inspections again, because COVID isn't uh, prohibiting us from doing that, but also this policy would help us to um, process those cases in a quicker way, so we'd envisage that the impact of that would be that the budget would be increased. Okay, so basically we're just we're, we're playing cat. Well, not I don't want to say playing catch up because that's not the wrong way, the right way to look at it. But we we are probably processing more because we were able to do more in terms of visits and as such. Yes. Okay, that's fair. That's a, it's a sound a sound idea. I can sort of see where it comes from now. Um, Four point two, which is the grants for boiler replacements. Um, that one always says obviously the grant does. It, 
quite often goes over the top. I mean, what sort of, what, on average, what is over the top of that looking like? Is that 10 percent, 15 percent, 20 percent? In terms of the, the amount that we envisage those grants yeah. being, um, on average, around 500 pounds, oh, um, because it's only paying for the ancillary works that aren't covered by that main grant. I think, think Councillor Corker made a good point on greening, and I think obviously with with, um, with boilers and the movement away to um, you, there are there are much greener boilers out there in the market place at the moment. So I think it's something the council needs to definitely look at. Um, I won't quote any names because it's not fair on the other the other people there. But the um, the marketplace has got significant um, green green energy. I, I think to look at. And I know that Andrew Waggett's team are aware of what they can and can't do. So I think it's a it's a, um, it's a sensible thing to do. Um, I want to just go down to the 4.5, which is the two options. And obviously, the option we're going with is 4.52 which is the interest-free one. Um, I just noted that it said about recycling the payment. So just explain to me, is, is that the fact that when someone repays their loan, we can give a loan on the back of that? Because that's what it sounds like. So the, the funding for this discretionary work comes from um, a capital pot which is made up of um, essentially repayments from historic loans. Um, and the idea is that uh, currently where we're giving out grants, that is diminishing. Um, so the, the idea behind this is that if we move to a model of providing loans, that money is coming back in which we can recycle to help further people. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. I'm just thinking obviously that we have a grant pot and then we're taking the grant pot away and effectively loaning residents the money, which I get. I get the point of when they sell the home, we obviously can take the money back from the charge point of view. It's just... Um, I just find it quite interesting that we're, we're doing it in this manner and actually it's something that I think we probably should have looked at doing potentially a lot, a lot earlier um, for a level playing field. Um, to, to me it's, a, it's an interesting scheme, I sort of see the reason for doing it and um, removing the means testing is quite sensible as well I think for, for a lot of the policy and you know I think we, what we don't want to do and I think it's been key in the, in the paper is not to exclude anyone. Um, from this, and I think it's, it's a testament that actually you guys have made the option of not to ensure that we're not excluding people from the process. So I wanted to say well done on that because that's one thing that worries me is the people that get dropped through the cracks. And I think having a policy where the most vulnerable in society don't get don't get dropped through the cracks is quite important. And the people that can't afford to have a new boiler, for example, and they can't afford to adapt their house in the way they are because of the way they have to live their lives. So it's quite an important. Um, quite an important paper actually so thank you for bringing it to us I think it's um, some good points that Councillor Corkery raised as well okay he's just put his hand up so I don't I know, know what yeah. I said but but Felicity beat him to it oh, okay so sorry you didn't see that Scott but that's all right Felicity hi um so I actually had a DFG built for me when I moved into my property um, is there any chance that you can do testing on them once they've been built because I'm having to have mine replaced for a second time in nine years and there should be a standard that's being met to DFGs they're obviously a lot of money 30,000 and um, to be throwing that away and keep replacing it um, I've just got problems galore with mine so is there a way to actually make sure that the people installing them are doing like a top-notch job uh, that can you know make make sure that that's going to be able to be used for the lifetime that it's meant to last a absolutely so I'm sorry to hear that you've had that negative experience um, the the building work um, obviously should comply with all of the relevant legislation so building control approval and all, all of that sort of um, quality control but also uh, within the private sector housing team when we um, are involved in providing those works uh, we have a dedicated officer that actually um, inspects the work um, to make sure that it's actually whilst it's being constructed that the con contractors are doing it to the standard that we would expect so um, those quality control checks are in place and we would hope that that would prevent those problems from occurring. Is that a new thing, um, the quality control, or how long has that been sort of like, are you looking at the standards, are they improving, because obviously there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, yeah. Yes, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's, um, it's not new within the last year or two, but it's, um, it's 
I would say it's newer than, than nine years ago, um, if that helps in any way of um, that reassurance for you. But um, quality is a certainly something that we're very aware of and is something that we are constantly striving, striving to make sure that we are working with contractors that provide the best quality of work um, and that, as I said, there are mechanisms in place for us to monitor that work as well. Thank you. Is that okay, Felicity? Thank you. Cal. Thank you. Yeah, that was a really great question. It's useful to hear people's real life experiences of using these services, which is the point of inviting people along to the residence consortium. So, thanks, Nick. Um, in t my question was just something that picks up on the basis of some of the um, questions Scott was asking. So, the interest free loan for homeowners. It seems to me there's still going to be a cost to the council providing an interest-free loan because yeah. if the council's borrowing the money, they're going to have to pay yeah. interest on it. So, yeah, my question is, what do we have an idea of what those costs are? I don't have those figures. Um, I don't know if my colleague from finance is able to answer. I, um, yeah, the borrowing rate at the moment is about 2.37% on the money that the... Um, Council's borrowed. So that's a, spread over a number of investments. So that's the latest figure I've heard on, on what our borrowing has cost us. So, so you're correct. So there will be a cost to us, but obviously um, not as much as, as Grant. Okay. But yeah, that's what I was just trying to get a kind yeah. of quantify it. So if the cost of the council is at 2.3%, we're doing some quick mental maths here, but say yeah, on okay, a 40 right. grand loan. It's going to be able to say about a grand, so the cost of the council is of providing that loan, essentially. Is that what we're looking at? I think I should clarify that the loan isn't 40,000, so we're talking about two completely separate things. So the, there's a disabled facilities grant, um, which is 40,000 maximum, and then we're talking about discretionary loans, which are a much lower value. Um, the, the maximum that we would provide is 25,000, but that is very rare that we would provide a, a assistance to that level and um, the average is around four or five thousand pounds okay so yeah right, no, that makes sense you, so I mean I guess I was just highlighting the fact no, no, that no, no, there's no, still I... the cost of providing this service to potential yeah. people and who I are uh, quite well and I want to, I want to come small and I want to come back to that when I'm when I, it's my turn but it's not my turn yet Scott again no, just uh, thanks for that Carl because I think um, where I was going with it but that's a really good point obviously so we're looking at about two and honestly it's about two four did you say 2.4 percent I think it was 2.4 percent um, and obviously Claire just said the maximum grant is 25,000 so what are we looking at the overall pot and budget to be because that's not explicit because obviously we're gonna have to borrow the money from somewhere and we've got budgets what would also hang on? What, th thanks for that. There's no trouble. Sorry to intervene. What also is the normal repayment period of these loans, or is it just because it's a charge on the property? It's, it's le the repayment plans are less of uh, well, the repayment plans are less of an issue. Sorry, there's a few different questions happening. I think so. I think I should just clarify that. The Disabled Facilities Grant, which we're talking about is the maximum of 40000 and is a grant, mm. comes from the Better Care Fund. So it's not money that the council... No, I'm talking about the loan. I'm really interested the in the loan. Discretionary loans. Um, again, I'll defer to my finance colleague here, but the, the money, the budget that's available for that comes from the repayments of previous loans. So we have a, um, a portfolio of... of historic loans that are coming back into the council and that money is being reused as we speak to, to assist people. Well, I'm, I'm just going to play devil's advocate quickly. So we could, if we want, people could just literally, on discretionary money, just literally turn money over and we could have more and more people apply and give out more and more loans to make the, the cycle much bigger and the repayments are just going to get much bigger and bigger and bigger. So what I'm getting at is what is the level of cost at the moment within that cycle? So you must know the number already that you've got of outstanding loans to know what we're doing to do this. I can tell you the budget that we have um, to perfect. provide these is 200,000. So it's 200,000 pounds is the budget. So yeah. effectively, Councillor Corky wants to know is 2.4% of 200,000. Is I think is probably the right way to look at it. 4,800 quid. Absolutely, yeah. But over 25 years, because that's effectively what the loan is. It's compound interest of 4.8. 
Paul. Yeah, hello. I think, and, I'll, and Alan will correct me if I'm wrong, but the pot of money that we're using for these discretionary loans is money that we've had. So there's no, but we haven't borrowed money. We're not, we're not paying any interest on that money. So we've had. Um, well, uh, I, I mean, where it, pr where it originally came from, I'm not, Claire may know, but that money that we've got now, you're right, is cycling round, but the council's not accruing any costs on that borrowing. So it's lo loaning out, and then the money comes back in, and then we loan it out again. There's no um, interest cost for the council on that. We're literally cycling round some money. Does that help? Um, hang on. Uh, well, I get this, but I, I, I want to make sure colleagues this. Sort of yeah, no, I, I get the point. Well, what I think the point I'm going to make is if the money recycles, there's going to come a point where the money that you're recycling is going to outstrip the demand potentially, and that could become a problem. So what if all of a sudden you have a, a load of applications compared to the money? You've got more people applying than you have got money coming in, is what I'm getting at. So, so, so one, one side's bigger than the other. But the policy does make clear that it's um, subject to fu um, funding availability. So the budget is available to provide assistance um, for the people who are applying for it. But it is no guarantee that every person who applies year on year will provide will will receive that money. What the point I'm getting to is, I think as and this is something that, especially with um, adaptations and, and things of that nature when people have their stuff done to their homes and they can't afford it. More and more people obviously are getting older so we're going we're gonna to see obviously that's going to have an impact um, especially on like, for example uh, their cost of living for example as they go through the thing. So what I'm getting at is there's going to be you're going to have more people applying and you're going to have more people meeting the criteria I think as we go through and that's what I'm getting at. The demand's going to get to a point in, in well, not now, not now. I'm, I'm not talking now. I'm talking down the line, further down the line. And it is going to have to be revisited at a certain point to see where it is. In terms of adaptations, that would be the disabled facilities grant. Um, I, I, well, what I'm talking about. I see, so you're talking, I'm basically. I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I'm sorry to intervene because I don't normally do. Felicity, you, I don't normally do. Well, you know, you know, you know, I, you know what I'm yeah, saying. I, I know exactly, what you mean, but I also understand where the officers are coming from as well. Yeah, I think we're mixing the two grants up as well. I think that's I mean, the, that's the well, point. I think the f it's not two grants. Well, you it's know, the grant and the loan scene. Yeah. yeah. I, I understand where I understand where everybody's coming from. What, what the concern I, I have is that we, we have a potential in five years down the line and actually having a lot of a lot of loans out, and then all of a sudden going, oh my God, our loans are outstripping our ability to recycle the money. And, and That's the concern. Sorry, I don't normally intervene, as you know. So, but I think the issue is, one, this is discretionary. And I think that's the first thing. I understand the point about lots of people will want everything done at the same time and we won't be able to meet that demand because the funding isn't there. Um, and I think that's a fair point. But I think the situation at the moment, which is essentially that a, a po this pot is dwindling. It's like, a, it's like drawing out a bank account without anything coming back in. This pot is dwindling, and this pot, if we don't take this sort of action, this pot's going to run out anyway at some stage. And then I think if it's going to run out, then all the things that you've said quite rightly are, are problems will be that with on steroids. I, I think, Scott. I think, yeah, absolutely, Dan. It just concerns me. I mean, it's not a bad idea, and I'm, don't get me wrong. I think what, what the idea and the, what we're trying to do is sensible. Um, it's just something I think it's probably... I'd look at revisiting, and I know we haven't revisited for 14 well, the, the, years, the, the, which is And I would say part of the problem is this hasn't, I mean, I'll yeah. come back to, I'll make that as part yeah. of my own comments, but the fact, one of the issues is this has not been touched for 15 years. Yeah, it needs to be um, probably looked at again in, I, I, I'd put a time scale of two years' time, just, just to see where we are. I, I, think, I think there's various things on that, Paul. Sorry, I wonder if it would help. Um, I know that some of these figures are reported through the quarterly governance and audit, and I wonder if we maybe we can develop something that enables you to monitor the, the uptake of this, because I think what you're asking, quite rightly, it's a really good point, is what happens if demand outstrips supply, and if we have, can have some measures that can show us if we're getting to that point. So we can look at developing something along those lines, if that would help. If you if Conservative and Labour colleagues on GASC are happy with that, I have no problem with that at all. I mean, I'll speak for my group and tell them they'd be happy with that. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm, right, that's that sorted. Is that okay, yep. Cal? And I'm sure we can pass that on to progressive and independent colleagues as well. 
Um, I've got no problem with that. Although, admittedly, Gask is always three months behind because of the way it works. So I think there's, there are some, there's some, there's some early warning mechanisms. In. Is, that, is that your range of, of yeah, questions and discussions? Yeah, okay, that's fine. That's right. Well, I wasn't going to say a lot either. I wasn't going to speak, but um, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, I think the direction of travel is very, very helpful. Um, Felicity's point about the quality of something is something I have frequently when I did this job first time round, um, but it sort of fell by the wayside when um, I didn't do this job after 2014, uh, because it's pretty clear the old DFG system was simply not fit for purpose, partly because of the quality issues that were being raised, partly because jobs were taking too long, partly because it was all not working, and partly because, like you, people were going, well, this is all a pile of rubbish. Um, and I, so I'm delighted that we're changing the system and actually uh, making it much more robust. The direction of travel, I think, is the, is the sensible way forwards. I mean, I was speaking to a contractor this morning who said the cost of concrete had gone up by 10%, uh, which is a bit scary. Um, and although we're not actually, hopefully, including concrete in all this, um, it's still right that we raise this issue. I like, like Scott, I like the idea of removing the means test, and that will also actually remove administrative costs as well, which means everything will go further. Um, I think it's always a balance between loans and grants. Uh, there's always a risk about people not paying it back, and I understand that, and that's why I'm prepared to go with the effectively recycling an existing pot. It is a discretionary pot, and whilst I understand Scott's points around what happens when the money runs out and putting in place early warning mechanisms to hope it doesn't. Um, it's either this or this pot is going to go. And if this pot goes, nobody gets anything. Um, I think it's right that we help people who pay the council tax, because this is coming out of what they call the general fund, not the housing revenue account, which is people's council tax, um, that, this is actually, that this is actually a sensible way forwards. Uh, with regards to Cal's points around environmentalism, um, just to say, when this report, I first had a look at this report, um, it was me who suggested in integrating the work of the boilers as well, partly because we needed to have as green a set of boilers as possible. And I would, um, for the minutes, um, I would want the team to go away um, and actually include something about environmental standards in here and how we'd want to work to environmental standards, but also recognise it is people's homes as well. And there's always a difficulty of, yes, we want to have the greenest possible standards, yes, we want to have it all, and then the homeowner saying, I don't want it. Uh, and that's always something that, you know, is there, but certainly our desire is to have the greenest possible standards, and that's why the boilers are in here. So the direction of travel, I think, is good. I think it actually will save the council money because it will remove the administrative burden uh, uh, of means testing. Um, I like the idea of the review. I think the GASC process, Paul, is, is a sensible one, and I think we may have to do that anyway. I think we should do that anyway if all political groups on GASC are agreed with that. Um, but I also think we do need an early warning mechanism. Because if your bank account is running low, it's very nice to have the bank telling you that. Um, and I think it's useful if we have that version of an early warning mechanism as well. Um, but I think this is a progressive way forwards. It deals with many of the issues that Felicity raised, and which certainly I had eight, eight years ago. Um, I'm delighted it's only taken eight years, but we finally got there. Um, and I hope it all works so that we can improve people's lives. So at the end of that monologue, um, I'm happy to approve this paper uh, with the additions that I've suggested, which I hope Anna and Democratic Services will note in a minute. And at that stage, um, I will close this meeting at eight minutes past five. Thank you very much. Have a safe trip home.